Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We just want to wor- welcome you guys to Joy Christian Fellowship. We're excited to worship with you guys this morning. So if you guys want to come down front, we're going to go ahead and get started. Who's ready to worship? Woo!
said in Psalms this morning that God wants to restore us to our first salvation, to our first love when we first got saved. God wants to bring that restoration back, what brings us joy. And I believe that God can restore so much this morning. He wants to restore families. He wants to just restore relationships. God is into the business of restoration. If you need that restoration this morning, let's just lift our hands and wait here for a second. I believe God is going to bring that restoration this morning. Spirit, move in this place. Oh, restore us, Jesus. Oh, holy Jesus. Oh, your holy Jesus. We wait on you, Jesus. Thank you. 
church, you may be seated. I love that we serve a God who is more powerful than any government or person. God reigns. How many of you guys are excited about that? Woo! My name is Beth, and I want to personally welcome you to Joy Christian Fellowship this morning. Um, we want to connect you with people in the church here. We don't uh, want you to come back and nobody to know your name. So uh, there's a welcome card um, in the pew in front of you. If you could just fill that out and then turn it into our connections people who are on the right here on your way out the door. We want to um, give you uh, some friendship and a free gift and welcome you personally to Joy today. Um, we also have uh, connect groups for all ages, children, men's, women, and the youth. Um, they run throughout the summer, and we uh, not only want to get to know your name, but we want to uh, invite you personally to a connect group. It's an awesome small group that meets uh, different places, houses, coffee shops. Um, some meet here at the church. Um, there's a connect wall with uh, pictures and information for you to um, try to try out a connect group, okay? You guys are welcome um, to come to those weekly. And also, um, Wednesday, July 2nd, that's right before the 4th, this week, coming up, we are going to have a special worship night. How many of you guys enjoyed the worship this morning? Yeah. It, it'll be longer, though. It's our worship um, night, uh, and there's a youth after party afterwards, so two really fun things. Come on out for that. You can bring your friends and family if they're in town here visiting. We'd love to have you. And guess what? Our first Joy Picnic is coming up July 13th. Yay! I love Joy Picnics. Um, we haven't had one since last August. Um, they're after church at Medford Oaks. The cost is $2 per person. We want to invite you to bring your own main dish and then something to share with everybody. And um, it's going to be an awesome time. Um, they're swimming. Uh, you can, I think they're at the pond. I think you can still fish in it. Um, it's just a great time to hang out, bring, bring uh, friends, um, something to sit on. And we're going to have a great time um, out at Medford Oaks, um, July the 13th. I want to go ahead and welcome up Pastor Denny for the offering. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's Santa, sorry, Santa in June. Okay, let's, uh, no, no, I'm going to be fine, really. Let me just put, take care of some of this stuff. Sometimes life gets busy, you know, and you get your hands full and take your hair. I don't need this up here, so let's move this right down there. Good. Okay, let's get everything in its place where it belongs. There's a phone in there. Oh, hang on a second. Let's get my wallet right in there. The keys. Oh. Let me make sure I keep that. There's some water for our speaker today. A checkbook up there. Got my folder. And this is a heavy. All right, you guys. How you all doing today? We're ready to get going. You know, sometimes life gets busy and you just carry a lot of stuff, don't you? And you just uh, got a lot going on. And uh, sometimes, you know, we, uh, as, as just as Christians, there's a lot of stuff we got going on. And sometimes some of the load that we carry or the burden that we carry is more than we ought. Sometimes, as I just demonstrated coming up here, there's a place for everything. Everything should probably be in its place. And uh, what I've got in my hand here is a beautiful, gorgeous, lovely, green lawn, front and backyard, right here. This sack cost me a hundred bucks, a hundred bucks. How many of you guys can see this beautiful green lawn? You don't see it. I see it, okay? I've got eyes of vision. I understand what happens with seed. Okay, and what we're going to talk about today is dealing with some of the things that God has given us. That's, that's good thud, huh? I like that. If you want to turn with me to uh, where are we at today? Let's get this stuff. This is all part of the message here because what happens is in our life we get so strung out, so discombobulated, we forget where we're at and what the important things are. In Philippians chapter 4. You guys want to turn there with me. 
Philippians chapter 4.15 says, As you know, Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Okay, they gave them financial help. Okay, even when I was in Thessalonica, oop, too far, you sent me help more than once. There was an attitude. There was a culture of giving. There was a culture of, of investing. There was a culture of sowing seed. You understand what I'm saying? I know that there's some of you that are in this place that are a lot like I was years and years ago. I fought giving. I fought it. I tried to find the Scriptures that even said you shouldn't be doing it in a New Testament church. Okay? I really did. I, I struggled with it. I didn't want to give. I thought, let the church deal with things. I remember one time talking with Pastor Steve when I first moved here in 1987. He asked me if I had life insurance. And I says, no. He goes, well, what happens if you, something happens to you? Who's going to take care of your wife and your kids? I said, well, the church will. He goes, we don't have any money. <laughs> so, you know, people get this wrong, this wrong perception about money and the church and all that. And I know that there's times when people come in and say, you know, the worship's good, the message is good, if we can just kind of skip past the offering part, you know. That, you know. But it's really important that, that we get an understanding of how God works and how His kingdom works. Even in Thessalonica, you helped me more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. We don't get up here because we're trying to extract more and more every week. That is not our job. That is not the purpose of why we try to help to educate you and give you an understanding about giving. And here it goes on to say, rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment I have all that I need and more, I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs according to His glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ. I want to tell you something. The reason why I came up here, had this, and had all this stuff in my hands, sometimes the things that we should be putting in its place more than all our stuff is what God has given us. Money can be a real encumbrance in your life. You'll drop everything but hold tightly to your money and to your seed, okay? The very thing that you should be planting, expecting a harvest, should be going into the ground, okay? It should be going into the ground so that way you can receive that harvest. When I put this in the ground, I am going to have years and years of reward. Trust me, I know this. I understand the principle. If you look back in... Um, I think it was back, it was about 1870 or so. Back in 1870, the amount of our population that was involved in agriculture was about close to 60%. In some way, shape, or form, they were involved in agriculture. They understood the principles of sowing and reaping. In 1910, right about that time, we were down to about 27% of our population was involved in agriculture. Today, we're less than 3% are involved in agriculture. So we don't necessarily grasp the idea of sowing and reaping, planting and harvest, seasons. But those things don't quite go through our mind the way we should understand them. God understood them. There'll be seed time and there'll be harvest. Seed time and harvest. Everybody say seed time and harvest. It's very important that we understand this. When we come up here and ask for your offering, it's not because we think that we need your money. It gets planted, trust me, and it goes to a good work. I look at all these young people here. I see these children up here. I see kids worshiping God. I see, I mean, from, we've been here a long time, a long time, and we have seen and we have prophesied and we have understood and, and had that vision for young people, our kids and our grandkids, being raised in the house of God, and we're seeing it, and it's exciting to us. That's what you're investing in. That's the seed that you're planting, and you get the reward. God does not, He's not a debtor to anyone. You guys understand where I'm coming from? I'm kind of going long. I understand that, so bear with me, okay? God is not a debtor to any man. He, he gives back abundantly, generously. And I had more scriptures. I'm going to stop here because it went long. Are you guys okay with this message? Go ahead, ushers.
Did we miss anybody? Just raise your hand, we'll come and get it. <laughs> Just kidding. Father, we thank you, Lord, as you are opening our minds to have a better understanding, Lord. We, we oftentimes think like the world, and we think if we just hold on to what we have that somehow we're going to preserve it and it's going to grow in that bag. And it doesn't, Lord. It doesn't. It has to be planted. The garden has to be tended. It has to be, the soil has to be tilled. It has to be watered. It has to be done in faith. There has to be an understanding, God, of, of your abundance and your blessing and your prosperity, the, the, what you want for your children, Lord. And I pray, Father God, more than just getting money, that you help to open up the minds of people to see how you operate in this kingdom, Lord. It's, a, it's, un, it's just amazing never ceases to amaze me, God, how good you are and how abundant you are. Father, bless this offering, Lord, as we continue to see lives transformed and souls saved and, and people who are just coming out of such a pit, Lord. They're, they're coming and hearing the gospel, Lord. They're giving their hearts to the Lord. Father, we're seeing the, the, the finances come into this house and bless so many people. We just thank you for it, Lord. Let it multiply, Father God. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right on. Well, we're going to continue on. Uh, Children's Church is dismissed. Get out of here, you little stinkers. And be good to your teacher. They're going to come and get me. And uh, we have a, an amazing man of God, one of my dear friends, and I'm glad you came into our life, Pete. I'd like to introduce to you Pete Miller. Thank you, sir. All right. Good morning. It's a pr privilege to sh share God's Word with you this morning. Pastor Steve and Kim give you greetings and love from sunny Southern California, where they're getting refreshed and revitalized, and it's wonderful. Uh, my wife and children, our teenage children, recently returned from a whirlwind trip to Seattle and uh, down the coast of uh, Washington and Oregon. And I got a couple pictures here for you. We went, of course, to the famous Pike's Place fish market where usually they're throwing fish, but they weren't throwing fish that day. They were throwing little crabs. That was kind of silly, and Lexi really loved the smell of the place. It was quite amazing. Down the block, a couple blocks down, is the original Starbucks where you can see about 50 or 60 or 70 people standing in line. That's the way it was the day we were there. To have a cup of Starbucks coffee, that's right, from the original shop. Although you can go right around the block, and you can not wait and get a Starbucks right around the block, because there's a Starbucks on about every corner in Seattle, that's right. Also, uh, some of the sights that can be seen, there's this great big Ferris wheel, it's 175 feet high. You can ride that Ferris wheel for $13, if you have a family of four, it's a little more. If you have a family of 10, never mind. Also, of course, the famous Space Needle, which is 605 feet high at the top of the spire. That was built for the World's Fair in 1962. And uh, we also looked at that without going up because it costs about $13 to go up in that, too. Yeah. Although I've been told it's worth it. Uh, we looked at it from the ground level. So. But one of the more famous sights to see in Seattle these days is the amazing gum wall. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a wall right down the alley from Pike's Place Market. More than one wall and windows and door frames covered in chewing gum. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and, and it's interesting that you can walk down there and you're not alone. There's about 30 or 40 people down there taking pictures of the gum wall. Matter of fact, when I found this picture on the internet this morning, uh, there were pictures of people proposing in front of the gum wall. People, they were kissing in front of the gum wall. Family photos in front of the gum wall. That's right. There were a lot of people chewing gum and adding their contribution to the gum wall, including my daughter. That's right. That's right. Which has nothing to do with this morning's message. But I thought that we've uh, either come a long way in some direction from the tremendous architectural feat of the Space Needle 
1962 to 2014, the Seattle Gum Wall. Yeah. This morning I would like to share uh, some historical background, maybe some archaeological background, and a little overview of the great book of Ephesians. Please don't turn there yet. We're going to look at a few pictures. And uh, I've entitled this God's Love Letter to the Church. Ephesians is the greatest revelation ever given to the Christian church. If we have the first slide up, on, it's going to be a little map, I hope. <laughs> there it is. Can you see it? You can see Ephesus over here on what is now the west coast of Turkey, relative to Jerusalem down here, and Rome and Italy, Athens and Corinth and Greece, of course. And I wanted to give you a, a picture of where Ephesus was. In its time, although it was founded at approximately 1100 BC, it reached its height as a chief center of uh, distribution and merchandise and, and uh, business uh, during the reign of Augustus Caesar, shortly after the birth of Jesus Christ, and it became the largest commercial center in the Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria, Egypt. You can't see Alexandria on that map, but it's over uh, to the west. And its population it was estimated at approximately 250,000 people. So when you look at the book of Ephesians, when you read about Ephesus in the Bible, it wasn't just some little podunk town. It was a great big city like Seattle. It was a great big city like Portland. It was certainly larger than Medford, and it was a fantastic area, commercial area. One of the famous sites in Ephesus was the temple of the goddess Artemis, also called Diana of the Ephesians in the book of Acts. This temple was approximately 225 by 425 feet at its base. It was completely made of marble. It was supported by 127 pillars, six feet in diameter, diameter rising to the height of 60 to 65 feet. Uh, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it was destroyed by the Goths in 263 AD. Today, all that remains are a couple of pieces of pillar, and that whole area there now is a swamp. Another tremendous architectural feat that was done was the fantastic amphitheater. This is mentioned in Acts 19.29, and it could seat 24,000 people, and it's still the best preserved ruins in Ephesus. I want to show you another photo of that fantastic amphitheater. Isn't that beautiful? How wonderful it would be to walk through that and look at that. Uh, Ephesus did not last long. It wasn't just the wars that destroyed it, but literally earthquakes and malarial mosquitoes finally finished off Ephesus somewhere between the 6th and 10th century, and the whole area was abandoned by the 14th century. However, today, you can go to Turkey, if you can get in, and you can still see some of these beautiful ruins, but it basically looks like a pile of rubble. The reason that I want you to see this, and there's one more shot. Isn't that something? There I am. No, that's not me. <laughs> I, I wish that was me. Isn't that fantastic? I, I love this kind of a thing. But the thing that is so tremendous about it is that Ephesus at one time was the center of the greatest move of the Word of God in the first century. Today it's just a pile of ruins. That's something. Today that fantastic temple that was to Diana is just a few pieces, fragments left in a mosquito-infested swamp. Isn't that amazing? The story or narrative of the birth and growth of the church at Ephesus is in Acts chapter 19. I want to quickly kind of summarize part of that for you. Paul actually did go to Ephesus very briefly in chapter 18, but he did not stay. He only preached once 
on a Sabbath day. They asked him to stay, but he took off. And he did return, however, around 52 A.D. to Ephesus. And that's where he met some disciples. These disciples had been taught by a man whose name was Apollos. He was from Alexandria, Egypt. And Apollos only knew the baptism of John, a water baptism. The believers in Ephesus had never heard of the Holy Spirit. So when Paul got there, he asked them, uh, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? That well, We haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. So Paul took the time to teach these men, this small group of disciples, and led them into the manifestation of speaking in tongues. And it also says they prophesied in Acts chapter 19. And it says all of them were about 12. Now, that's not 12 years old. That's about 12 men. Well, I don't know why it says about 12, but that's what it says. Were there 11? I don't know. Could be. Paul took these men, these believers, and he went into the synagogue in Ephesus, and he preached for three months. Every Sabbath day he was teaching all the revelation that God had given him and showing how the Old Testament and the New Revelation was fitting together, how Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises and how the you know, Holy Spirit had been given on the day of Pentecost. And, of course, he talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and all the greatness of the gospel he was preaching. But it says that there were many that were hardened. They got hardened of heart. These would have been Jews primarily, entirely at the synagogue. And it said that they spoke evil of the way. Before they were called Christians, they were called followers of the way because Jesus Christ said, I am the way. They literally called them followers of the way. And they spoke evil of those people, so Paul quit. Nope, he didn't. He took those disciples, the believers that were listening, that were paying attention, that were hot and excited about the Word of God, and he took them to a lecture hall called the School or Hall of Tyrannus. And this is all in chapter 19. And, fr and he spent two years teaching Two years he spent at Ephesus, two years and three months, teaching the Word of God, teaching and teaching and teaching. And it says that in the course of that two years and three months, all Asia Minor, Asia Minor which is now Turkey, heard the Word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles. Two years and three months, all Asia Minor, that whole geographical area, heard the word of God in two years and three months. A feat which has never been duplicated with all of our modern uh, internet and newspapers and magazines and television, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He was able with that fantastically excited group of believers to move that word of God out. It says there were extraordinary miracles that people would actually bring handkerchiefs to the Apostle Paul, and, and, and he could send, but he would just touch them and send them back to somebody, and somebody get healed. Now, there was no healing in the handkerchief. The point was is that the level of believing was so fantastic that those tremendous miracles could take place. It also records in Acts 19 how there were seven sons of Sceva, who was a high priest, and they decided they're going to go around trying to be exorcists, and they're going to go around trying to cast out devil spirits, evil spirits, demons, and they said, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the, and the spirit of, that was in the man said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And, it, and, those, and the spirit, the man jumped on those seven guys and beat the tar out of them. It says they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And at that point it says, and you can put that scripture up, I think, at this point, where it says that the Name, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Acts 19, 17. The name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Imagine in Medford or in Central Point or in White City or Eagle Point or Ashland or wherever you live or wherever you might be who are watching on the live stream. Imagine your community that the name of the Lord Jesus is magnified. Holy moly. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Not degraded, not used as a curse word. Magnified. The name of Jesus Christ was magnified. It goes on in chapter 19 that all those people that were using black arts, curious arts, it talks about uh, occult things, they brought their books together 
and they burned them, and they counted the value of those books, and it says it was at that time valued at 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, I looked this up, and it's really anywhere between $7,500 and $10,000 worth of books that they burned. And in Acts 19.20, that verse, Acts 19.20, which I think you've got up on the screen, that is the apex, the pinnacle of the move of the Word of God in the first century. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. So the Word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, prevailed, it dominated. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we want to go. That's where we want to go. We can't quit. We have to live this Word of God to the utmost of our ability, preach the Word of God, teach the Word of God, speak the Word of God to the end that it prevails. It prevails. Where does it prevail first? It has to prevail first in your mind and in mine, in your heart and in mine. That's where the Word of God must live and prevail. In your family, in your marriage, in your connect group, in your church family. Get the picture? What a fantastic reality. Right after that, in Acts 19.21, it says, after these things were ended. And it goes on that Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. And he wanted so much to spread the Word of God to his fellow Israelites on that day of Pentecost coming up, another Pentecost. God warned them over and over, through different people and a prophet and prophetesses, don't go, don't go, don't go. And he decided he would go, and he did, and he did get arrested, and he was never able to return to that great city of Ephesus. I can't imagine what would have happened had he stayed. I have no idea. We know that God called him to witness to kings, and indeed he did. But what a wonderful thing was happening in that fantastic area of Ephesus. He did have a meeting with the elders of the Ephesian church. That's also recorded in Acts 20 in a different city about 50 miles south of Ephesus. But he never did. He told them he'd never see them again, and he never did. So this book of Ephesians was written from prison at about 62. He arrived in Ephesus around 52. He spent two years and three months and moved that word of God, and it was still growing. He had left Timothy in Ephesus. It was a fantastic church, probably the greatest church in the whole Mediterranean area in the first century. But from prison, he would write what we know as the book of Ephesians around 62 or 63. The book of Ephesians, as I said, is the greatest revelation ever given to the church, the body of Christ, and I hope that I can sum up some of it for you, sum up some of the chapters and reselect verses and give you a feel for the heart of this revelation. Again, I called this God's love letter to the church. Romans teaches faith. Thessalonians teaches hope. Ephesians shows the depth of the love of God, faith, hope, and love. Chapter 1 begins with, how we as individuals and as the church have received every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It says we've been chosen in Christ to be holy and without fault in God's eyes, chosen from before the foundation of the world, it says. It says we've been redeemed and we've been forgiven. We have been identified as God's own with the gift of Holy Spirit as a down payment of our inheritance. It goes on in chapter 1 as Paul prays and expressing God's desire that we will be spiritually enlightened so that we can mentally grasp the hope, our great hope, and the mighty resurrection power that we have as His church, the body of Christ, of whom Christ is the head. And we're going to read a few verses in chapter 1. This is from the New Living that I chose today. I think it expresses it pretty beautifully. In chapter 1, verses 3 and following, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Well, if you got every spiritual blessing, then are you lacking anything? No, you're not. Colossians says that we're complete in Him. 
We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us, and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 19 through 23, it says, I also pray, this is that great prayer in chapter 1, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and it seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and he has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Wow, that is fantastic. That is fantastic. You are a part of the body of Christ as a member in particular. You are a part of the church, the body of Christ, and Christ is the head, and Christ fills every believer. Oh my goodness, people, when we really get this, the word can be to prevail the word can begin to prevail again. Chapter 2 starts with a reminder of God's great love for us, that even when we were dead spiritually, Christ made us alive in him. We have been raised and seated with Christ in heaven, and all of this comes by his grace, which we receive through faith. Christ has made one church out of the Jews and the Gentiles, those who had the covenant, the Jews, and those who were hopeless and without God, Gentiles. And we both have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ's perfect work on the cross. Now we all have access to the same Father through God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. Together we, the church, are the spiritual temple of God. It says God's habitation God's dwelling place, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Chapter 2 in the New Living says, once you were dead, these are just a few of the verses, there's more, but we can't read it all, but you can. Once we were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, once you were dead, we were dead. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Amen to that. So none of us can boast about it. For we, it says, are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Isn't that fantastic? Absolutely fantastic. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Well, that is the church, the temple, the habitation, the dwelling place of God. It is not a physical temple anymore made of walls of gum. No. It's a spiritual temple. And we are all the stones, living stones, that make up the temple of God today, the dwelling place of God today. The foundation stone is Jesus Christ and all of the apostles and prophets. That's that fantastic foundation. And we and all Christians everywhere from all times make up this great spiritual temple of God. Chapter 3 opens with details of the mystery of Christ. A mystery which was not ever made known unto anyone until it was revealed unto the apostle Paul by revelation, specifically that the Gentiles 
would be fellow heirs together with Israel, members of the same body, and partakers of the promised blessings in Christ Jesus. I don't have this verse up here for you, but Colossians 127 goes on to say that the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The great mystery, it wasn't a mystery that God would bless the Gentiles, but that Gentiles would be equal, fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers together of all the promises. That is fantastic. And not only that, but that each and every believer would have Christ in them, Christ the hope of glory, Christ inside you, Christ in you, Christ in you. That's what it means. That was, that was the great secret. It said, had the devil known that, the princes of this world known, he never would have crucified the Lord of glory if he knew that there would be Christ in every believer. Having one Jesus was bad enough. <laughs> yes, that's right. But now, wherever there's a believer, wherever there's a believer, it's Christ inside you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ inside your body. How long? Eternal life. That's how long. Eternal. Man. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, my. Chapter 3. Opens, I, I read that, didn't I? I did. I got sidetracked, didn't I? God's eternal purpose is revealed in chapter 3, that the church would display God's wisdom in its rich variety. I love that. God's wisdom displayed in its rich variety. Think of the variety in the church. And with Christ in every believer and all your specific, unique gifts and talents and abilities, and when all the unique talents and gifts and abilities with Christ inside you is all working together, oh my, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? You can do fantastic things together. You can do fantastic things by yourself, but God called us to be together, together. The church, the church, the body of Christ, of which we're members in particular, and you can't say, like Corinthians 12 says, I don't need you. I don't need you. We do need each other, and that's the will of God. That's why it's not right for someone to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Sorry, you're wrong. Now, maybe you've had a hard time in church. You want to talk about hard times in church? You can talk to me or a few other people about getting hurt and offended and hurt and cast out and messed around with. I understand that stuff. I do. But the will of God is still the church working together with Christ inside of us. Okay. I think I made that point fairly clear. <laughs> yeah. God's desire is expressed again in Paul's prayer, to another great prayer. When you read a prayer, it is the heart of God expressed. When Paul is praying, it's God's heart expressed. It's not just Paul. It's revelation. It's revelation. When Paul prays, he is praying the word of and the will of God in that prayer. And it's this Great desire of God that believers know and experience the love of God and to be filled with the fullness of God, this God who through his mighty power at work within us is able to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think. That's right. Praise God is right. Uh, let's read a few verses from chapter 3. and We're going to go look at that prayer. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources... He will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is for you. May you experience the love of Christ though it's too great to understand fully. <laughs> then you will be made complete 
with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Is that magnificent? I can't see the clock. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much. Yes, amen to that too. Chapter 4 teaches us that we are to live a life worthy of God's calling. When you start to put this together, I would hope that it's the word beseeching us, it's the word imploring us. It's like after all that Jesus Christ has done, after all that God has done, after all that he's given us, after all that we have, after all that we can be, God is teaching us to live our lives worthy of this calling that we have received in Christ. We're called to make every effort to maintain unity as a body of believers, and that is one of my life verses. We are called to maintain unity as a body of believers. Whenever there is a division, the adversary is winning. Whenever there is a schism, whenever there is fights among the believers, whenever there is, you know, this separation and that new church and this, and I know that through the generations, through the centuries, the body of Christ has been splintered and dismembered quite awfully, but the will of God is still stands. It's still the same. He wants to see unity among his people. He does not want to see division, and wherever that ever begins to occur, we need to strive to mend it. We need to do whatever we can to have spiritual unity. Does that make sense to you? That is the will of God. Every time that we fix something and help repair or a breach or amend among a brother or sister, a family member, whoever it is, however it occurred, whatever the situation, there must be a solution in the Word of God, and I believe there is. And when we fix things, we're doing what God wants us to do. He said, blessed be the peacemakers. What do you think that means? Let's make unity. Let's keep it together. That's what it means. Jesus Christ has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So again, you can't go running off and saying, you know, well, I just, I just listened to the Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, just me and Jesus. Oh, boy. You are in trouble. You are in trouble because Jesus Christ gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why did he do that? To prepare us for works of service so that the church, the body of Christ, may be built up, growing up to become more like Christ. We are instructed to renew our minds, to change the way we think, and to think the thoughts of the new man, Christ, inside of us. And that is how we, in our lifestyles, become righteous and holy. Not holier than thou, but righteous in that we're thinking and living rightly and holy and that we are separated and sanctified to do the will of God. Does that make sense for you? We are to get along and work together as God's family. Chapter 4, some of the verses here. Is this all right? (laughs) Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you, You know, when you read that, that's like God begging. Why does God have to beg? I don't know. Because we're dense, maybe. You know, we keep, you know, when you, as parents, you you tell your kids over and 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 over, and you go, God, why? Why do I have to tell you? I've told you a million times, you know? And then you got to think, And God has told us a million times, why don't you obey this time? Yeah, Yeah, it's so true. He begs us to live a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Let me tell you something. If you are a Christian, if you are born again, if you are saved, you are called. You are called. You're not a Christian and not called. You might not know specifically the details of your calling, but if you stay faithful, you will find out. And if you do not stay faithful, you will not find out. So I encourage you to stay faithful. Ephesians is addressed to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who you are and need to be, faithful in Christ, faithful in Christ. It doesn't say perfect. It says faithful. All right. 
I keep losing my spot here. Always be humble and gentle. Oh, boy. <laughs> be patient with each other. Oh, no. Making allowance for each other's faults. I didn't write this. <laughs> because of your love, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, Christ. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Wow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's where we want to be. Chapter 5 emphasizes that we're to be imitators of God and live a life of love because Christ so loved us and he gave himself up for us as a sacrifice to God. We're to put away sexual immorality, impurity, greed, foolishness. Why? Because it's inappropriate for God's holy people. We are to live as children of light, to learn about what pleases the Lord. We're to use our time wisely and to make use of every opportunity to understand the Lord's will. We're instructed to give thanks to God always and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This chapter 5 spotlights the tremendous marriage relationship as God designed it with instructions for husbands and wives, which illustrates the love of Christ for the church. A few verses out of chapter 5, imitate God. There it is. In everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And gentes and ladlemen, these days are evil. I mean, ladies and gentlemen. It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Further in chapter 5, give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's why we do it. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is fantastic, especially in our day and time when marriage is trying, they're trying to redefine it all. The Word of God stands, and the Word of God is the will of God. All right. Chapter 6 continues the importance of the Christian family with instructions to children and fathers, also to employers and employees. As this letter closes, believers are encouraged to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power and to remember that we are in a spiritual conflict. We are to equip ourselves with all the resources that God has provided us, the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit and continually to pray in the Spirit for each other so that we can stand firm against the devil's attacks and having done all to stand for God. Let's look at a few of these verses. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, and this is the right thing to do. Pretty straightforward. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. I'll tell you, that'll help a lot of us through the days, huh? Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. You're not going to make it trying to be strong on your own and in your power. You can take that power of God that He's given you, that resurrection power of Christ that's inside your body, and it says, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor, and I don't think this is just a suggestion. I would call it a command. It's imperative. It's imperative. It's necessary. It's required. We need this. 
We need this. Why? So that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. It looks like it. On the outside, to the census eye, it looks like it's all happening, you know, between people. But the Word of God teaches us that it's not flesh and blood, it's spiritual. It's against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits, it says. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Isn't that fantastic? Stand your ground. Stand your ground. Look, we make mistakes. We get out of fellowship sometimes. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we fall, right? Get back up. Get back up. When you don't want to go to church, you better go. When you don't want to get into that connect group or, or be with having fellowship with like-minded believers, that's the time when you better get your hind end there. You better get there. That's true. It's true. And you will find that when you do that, you will get your needs specifically met. There will be answers for you. There will be people loving you and praying and for you and helping you. We need each other. We need each other. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion, every time you can remember to do it. Stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And finally, this, chap, this book closes with this beautiful benediction. Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters. And may, the God, may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that magnificent? Ephesians begins with all that God accomplished in Christ for us. It teaches us about the power of Christ in us. It teaches us how to function as Christ-filled believers together in God's dwelling place, the church. Ephesians concludes with encouragement to use all the resources that God has given us to overcome our enemy and stand strong as a victorious team. As God's chosen children, we are God's masterpieces as individuals, yes. But even greater, we are God's masterpiece as the church, the body of Christ. Why is this the greatest revelation? Because in one short letter... The amazing, fantastic goodness of God is detailed in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And man is taken from the depths of despair, dead, in trespasses and sins, without God and without hope, to the heights of exaltation, raised with Christ and seated with Christ in the heavenlies. From death to life, from without hope to hopeful without strength to strong. The incomprehensible grace of God is displayed in all of its abundance. His unequaled mercy is demonstrated in its full richness, and the Father's limitless love is poured out in its true greatness. My heart's desire is that this will just in, encourage you and inspire you to read Ephesians, but to approach every book of the Bible, especially the, the church epistles, New Testament and church epistles, just to read it, to read it for the greatness of the truth that's in there. It is full, it is rich, it is loaded, and it's to you, and it's for you. Let's all stand, please. Week after week, 
We have people that come in here for lots of different reasons. Some people are discouraged. Some people are afraid. Some people are confused. Some people, they just want to know what, what, what's happening at church or what's happening at this church. Some people are maybe know that they're looking for Jesus Christ and they, they know they need God. Some other people, maybe you've been a Christian and maybe you've walked away. I walked away for almost 10 years, but God never gave up on me. And he never gives up on you. Never gives up on you. So if you've come in here today and you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ, if you would like to get saved maybe for the first time or recommit your life again to serve the Lord and to walk with the Father and to, to know intimately our Lord Jesus Christ, I'd like to invite you to step on down out of your seat and come down here where we've got some people and we'd like to pray with you. We don't have you pray aloud. We just want to bless you. We want to help you. We'd like to get connected with you. We'd like to learn your name. We'd like to get a prayer request from you. And if there's any way that we can bless you and help you, we would like to do that. If there's anyone that would like to come down today and give their life to the Lord today, now is a great time. It's a great day to get born again. It's a great day to get saved. That's right. Come on down. There may be, I think there might be more people in here today, and if there are any men, women, children, anyone, if you would like to know intimately the truth and reality of Jesus Christ and, and the Father, God our Father, what Jesus did for you, how he gave his life to save you, how he gave his body in, in torture so that you could be healed, you can get healed today, you can get saved today, and your life can change today. You can get on a new course, a new path today. Anybody else come on down? And again, I just want to mention, if you have come in here and maybe you've had background in Christianity, but you've walked away, um, God bless you. And, and, and we just want very much to uh, reach out to you and help you and bless you in every way that we can. We're not perfect, nor is any church. But we love the Lord and we love the Word of God and we believe that God's Word and the Lord Jesus Christ is the answer. All right. Let's pray this together. Dear Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you've called me. We praise you today, Father, for saving us. We know that if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and believe that you, Father, have raised him from the dead, your word says we will be saved. We know that your word says that if we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. And if we call on the name of the Lord, we will not be ashamed we will not be disappointed in our expectation. We call on your name and thank you today. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for taking away the shame. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for clarifying our call. Father, bless our church today. We praise you and just give you this time together. In the name of Jesus Christ. How about a big amen? amen? Thank you very much. I've loved sharing the word with you. I just want to pray one more prayer with you and send you on your way. I want to thank Pastor Stephen Kim again for extending this great privilege. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, bless your people. Father, may your word live and prevail in the hearts and minds of your people. Father, I just thank you and praise you and bless these people, giving them a great day today, great connect groups, a great week coming up. Father, that your name can be magnified. We praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great day.